think of of the of our research. I'm also aware that some of you might have um, been thinking, well, you know, it's about form policy and how does that sit with index and inclusion and exclusion. But again, I hope I can convince you a bit that you know there's really an added value in having this exercise and that there are actually more commonalities than differences. At the same time, again, I'm looking forward to hear from you where you notice that maybe sometimes my definitions or my conceptualizations are a bit different and maybe need a bit more explanation. So please always feel free to interrupt me also if you want to later on go back to some of the things. Of course, I'm very much looking forward to that. I will now share my screen. Um, because in the end, I just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of what the kind of research is um, that I've been engaging on. And as Ivan was already saying, um, actually all of it is together with me, right? So we really make a good fighting team. Um, and we spend in the end, last three, four years, really thinking about how domestic trends impact European foreign policy cooperation. And what we find so fascinating is that there are actually two different stories to tell or two different trends that are also very often investigated separately. So on the one hand, let me see how I can move my screen it's like this. Ah, now, on the other hand, um, we really have been observing increased institutionalization, but also an increased ambition in European foreign policy cooperation. And here I brought you in the end, one of the first paragraphs of the EU global strategy from 2016, um, where you really could see that the tone of the foreign policy community in terms of what they try to achieve in their, in their joint cooperation has been stepping up. It's a lot about you know, being able to be autonomous, to, to develop a strategy that doesn't make you dependent on other global actors. Um, but at the same time, we also have an increased institutionalization, not latest since the Lisbon Treaty, and we'll talk about this a bit later. So we see that we have now a kind of EU foreign policy, uh, a kind of EU European Union foreign ministry with the European External Action Service, and we have this beefed up role of the high representative, who is not really supposed to be the center of European foreign policy cooperation. Um, and by the way, the only institutional actor who is actually part of two institutions in the European Union. So they actually had to change their treaties to make this role possible. So on the one hand, this all sounds very positive. There was a lot happening in the last 10 years. You might also have heard things like the Strategic Compass on Defense, uh, PESCO, the Puerto Rico, the Permanent Structure Cooperation on Defense. So there are lots of things happening. But what we find so interesting, I will jump over this for a moment, is that there's also another trend that has been increasingly noticed in the past four or five years. And that is this trend of increased disagreement between the member states. Uh, and here I just brought you some snippets um, of, of, of newspapers that really show this increased disagreement. So you really hear in the last two, and three, two, three, two to three years, more and more the member states can't agree. Member states can't agree uh, on, the rush, on the sanctions against Belarus. Member states couldn't agree uh, on, on the position on Israel. Um, I brought you here also EU states rejecting UN migration pacts. I know that there are some migration experts a bit that know more about migration than me do in, in, in the audience. But what is interesting that we have more and more of these instances, and it even went so far that this 2009 political, which of course is very heisserisch, I would say, you know, sometimes trying to make uh, big headlines, but they really talked about. Uh, this dark day, the Black Monday of European foreign policy making in 2009, because in the end of Foreign Affairs Council, so the main decision making body in European foreign policy cooperation, could not agree on three issues that were really very central at the time. So they had no conclusions on the Arab League positioning. They couldn't agree on a position on Venezuela that was during the time of the coup. And they didn't manage to have a statement on the intermediate nuclear. Um, uh, force treaty. So in the end, the treaty that was running out. And that really surprised the community because everyone knew that these are very key issues for, for European Union from policy making, but nevertheless, member states didn't, didn't manage to agree. Again, what I find so interesting, and together with Nick Wright and some others, um, is, apologize, is really that we see these two different trends and we ask ourselves, 
what is going on there? How can it be that you have, on the one hand, increased ambition, increased institutionalization, but on the other hand, we see more and more disagreements on the side of the member states? Um, and we really think that this, this tension between this, these two different trends gives us a lot of interesting questions. It asks, tells us, you know, when are they in tension and under what conditions actually does it not matter that we have these two different dynamics? What are the dynamics between them? So are they actually enforcing the, each other or are they going in opposite um, directions? But also, of course, this wider question, what impact does this tension between institutionalization and more vision and disagreement of member states have on national, European and global cooperation? So these, of course, are very big questions, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to, to suggest that I'm the only one uh, working on this. So as I already said, um, most of this work that I'm talking today about is together with Nick Wright from the University College London, but also many of the discussions that I had with colleagues in two Jean Monnet networks um, that we had, Nordia and Rentbert, and I also put the link in the chat in case you're interested. We really tried also to be a bit more on time with what is going on currently and how can we make sense of it than sometimes our publication written allows us. So this is in the end the background of, of the talk that I thought could be of interest to you. Um, and again, the main question that I would like to propose is the following. So is European domestic politics changing in a way that it has a long, long lasting effect in European foreign policy cooperation and thus on European Union foreign policy. And I think that's maybe quite, quite important to point out here. When I talk about foreign policy cooperation, I really mean the foreign policy making of the 27 member states and the collective effort that they're doing in Brussels as the European foreign policy. So I also have, of course, a very political perspective on foreign policy cooperation, but that, is least, that at least is where I'm departing from. With this question in mind, I want to, in the end, propose three arguments um, that I think very much also show you my journey <laughs> of the past three years through these topics. So on the one hand, I want to talk a bit more about the last 50 years of European foreign policy cooperation and why we have to be very careful in qualifying or trying to see the added value of the institutionalization that has been taking place. So we see, of course, more and more actors. We see a stronger, higher representative but at the same time, we have to be very careful not to com confuse this with, with an argument on centralization. So there are some scholars in the governance literature that sometimes try to tell us that we see now the high representative taking over from the member states. Um, and in our research with Nick, we really very much want to refute this argument and saying, no, it's what we're seeing is a highly complex system where the high representative, the external action service, the European Commission, and many other actors have a central role but in order to understand European foreign policy cooperation, you have to understand the position of the member states, the role of the member states and their ambition. The second point that I want to, I thought would be useful for us to think about is really about this notion that foreign policy making begins at home. Um, and I want to, to spend a bit of time to think with you of how can you cooperate when co populists at home question the very essence of cooperation and the very idea of compromising, for example. And again, here, this is very much um, still work in progress and a lot of thinking going on. So I'm really looking forward to, to see what you, what you think about, about our ideas there. And then I want to conclude with a more systemic perspective. And that's a current, some current work that Nick and I have been engaged on, where we joined a group of scholars um, that all wanted to use contestation in order to make sense of European foreign policy cooperation. Um, and Nick and I, in the end, started to become the devil's advocate by proposing that if you want to use contestation to understand a transgovernmental system like the common foreign and security policy, um, we actually have to adapt the concept and we have to think a bit more strongly of what contestation in a systemic, in a systemic manner can actually mean and how it would look like. So this is the last thing that I want to do. So this is in the end uh, a bit our menu and I don't want to spend too much time as I said because I'm really looking forward also to your discussion. Some of the things I would just um, mention but again please feel free to then draw me back in our question answer and in our discussion in case you would like to know more details. I also put the link um, 
to our article and to a policy brief in the chat in case you're interested. I will mention them later. Um, but I thought it's maybe nice for you for you to have. So, oh, one thing that I should maybe still mention at this point before we go into the first topic is that we also had different perspectives on this question. So in order to really answer this big question on, you know, is European domestic politics having a long lasting effect on European foreign policy cooperation, we take different accounts. So the first, I think the way we started off was really a very institutionalist account, very new institutionalist account. We just wanted to see how the position of member states institutionally changed in the foreign policy cooperation system since the Lisbon Treaty. In the second step, um, I will go back a bit more to the populism literature. I already want to warn you here, I'm not claiming that I'm an expert on populism, not at all, but I just found it interesting to really engage with a bit of a different literature and really to take the next step and think, why is this relevant for me from a foreign policy perspective? Whereas then the last point is really there, I go back to my roots and I'm really taking a systemic account of making sense of contestation in a transnational transgovernmental system. So to get us started off with, um, Nick and I started this research on the paper uh, really in, in, with the spirit in mind that we had a lot of colleagues who looked at institutional changes with the Lisbon Treaty. So we have a lot of research about how the European Action, Action Service is changing um, the interaction in Brussels. We have a lot of research at the moment with 10 years of new high representative, you know, what is, what is the effect of this new role? Um, as Ivan was already mentioning in my Marie Curie project, I actually look at the role or the impact of the Lisbon Treaty on European foreign policy cooperation abroad so in third countries and how European diplomacy is impacted by these new mechanisms. But what we found most fascinating that although everyone acknowledged that, of course, these new actors are part of a wider system, there were only a few colleagues who actually looked at how the rest of the system is impacted through these changes. And that's in the end what we tried to do in this paper, where we chose the Political and Security Committee, so an ambassadorial committee in the Council of the Ministers um, that focuses specifically on foreign policy and prepares the Foreign Affairs Council. And we wanted to see how the role of this committee had been adjusted, adapted, shifted um, through the reforms of the Lisbon Treaty. So it was not necessarily about domestic politics, but we really looked, took an institutionalist account in saying, you know, it, there was no plan in the Lisbon Treaty to change the role of the member states, but we should not assume that their role stays the same if we change all the other elements of the system. And what Nick and me in the end did is we went to Brussels a couple of times. And what was really interesting, it was the first time that I actually did interviews uh, as, as a couple. So we were two interviewees, uh, two interviewers vis-a-vis -vis an interviewee, but which, which really, I think, created quite a different dynamic, but was a very enjoyable experience. So if everyone, anyone wants to talk about this, I'm happy to, to share a bit more insights there. Uh, and we had the opportunity to talk to the PC ambassadors. We talked um, to commission officials to other representatives of the member states and some other institutional actors. And in the end, our main finding again was that we saw more institutionalization, but not centralization. So the role of member states hadn't changed since the Lisbon Treaty, also because the decision-making roles hadn't changed. But nevertheless, there were a lot of unintended consequences. So to borrow a term from, from a very dear colleague who, who wrote this whole special issue, on unintended consequences in European foreign policy making. But what we found so interesting is that actually no one had thought about what effect these reforms would have on the member states. And what we found um, is in the end three things. So on the one hand, of course, by not having the European Action Action Service and the High Representative much stronger in this role of initiating agenda setting and also supporting the implementation of foreign policy making. It created a competition with the political and security committee who had been created in the 90s to be the strategic impetus, the strategic linchpin of European foreign policy making. Originally, of course, much more with a focus on security and defense, but the whole idea of this committee in its very existence had been that they think strategically about foreign policy making. And now they had these other two actors now in the end joining them in, 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 this, in this task. 
And what was interesting is that when we talked to PC ambassadors, we could also see how they reflected on the shift in the role that they are having now. So we got a lot that when we when we really at the end of our conversations that ambassadors in the end told us, you know, now talking to you, I realize we are not the strategy makers anymore, but we are much more having a role of oversight and monitoring of bringing the different elements together, but also making sure that what in the end is happening in Brussels is still in the interest of our member states. Related to this, and what we found quite interesting was that ambassadors also very much re um, reflected on the kind of energy that had been lost by replacing the voting presence in foreign policy making. So for those of you who know a bit about EU foreign policy making, we had the six months rotating presidency also in foreign policy and in the Foreign Affairs Council and all the council committees uh, related to it. But that had been adjusted with the Lisbon Treaty. So now we have a permanent presidency, either from a representative of the External Action Service or on the level of foreign ministers of the high representative. And what was interesting that our ambassadors actually told us, well, it took energy out of the system because when you were the presidency, you worked very hard to get things closed. You worked very hard to push things through. You put all your energy in trying um, to get a certain deal. But now for the chair, it's business as usual. You miss this energy that has been there for six months and really trying to, to, to push um, foreign policy cooperation forward in Europe. They're not saying that the, the new chairs are not doing a good job, but they also said, you know, for them, it's more a routine that they're going through. And you don't have this political momentum anymore in pushing certain, certain initiatives. The other thing that we found quite interesting was that our ambassadors reflected a lot on losing the we in their meetings. So they were saying, you know, now very often it's us, so the PC ambassadors versus the chair, but it's not us as a whole anymore. Um, and again, for those of you interested in the article, we bring actually quite some evidence um, that also shows that, of course, there's a political game going on. So we had several instances, instance, several events in the end, um, where ambassadors felt kind of portrayed, portrayed by the Excellent Action Service and the High Representative, because the High Representative went beyond the head to the foreign ministers because she didn't like what she was hearing at the PSC level. And you could really see that in terms of um, political leverage, um, this was really, this was really a no-go for the PSC ambassadors. The last point we found interesting, but maybe I will not uh, spend too much time on this, is also that we saw that the foreign affairs institutions that had been created to really create a hierarchical structure that combines all different kinds of discussions, in the end has been lost to the Lisbon Treaty because the European Council now is prepared by different bodies. And there you really see that although we have more discussions on foreign policy on the European Council level, very often all the preparatory bodies that we have, the Foreign Affairs Council, the PEC, uh, also all the working groups related to it are not necessarily part of these preparations anymore. And again, there we see an interesting, an interesting um, uh, tension here. So this is about the PSC. Now let me spend a bit of time to talk to you about, well, you know, now taking this idea of foreign policy making begins at home seriously, what does it mean that we actually see more populist trends across Europe? And again, here this is very much, um, work in progress. Um, and of course you can, you know, you can sometimes question of how do we qualify what is a populist government? So I remember long panels at conferences that I tried to join, where I tried to get a better sense of how can we actually measure populism. Um, so even if you disagree with the exact definition, I think no one can, no one can question that we see more populist trends in Europe. And the interesting thing, but well, the interesting question here for me is, does it also impact foreign policy making? And does it does also impact European foreign policy cooperation? And one thing that I still find most fascinating, there's actually not a lot of lit literature on it. There's not a lot of scholarship on the link between populism and foreign policy making. It's getting more now, but you also very often see that when I talk about this topic, people just come and say, ah, you know, you just call it populism, we call it politics. So I think there is also an interesting question of, how can you actually research that? What I did for this in the end is that I simply went to the literature 
And I tried to see how different experts on challenger parties and new transnational cleavages, but also in the populism literature, what, what they give me in terms of thinking of what impact populism might have on foreign policy making. And again, here I don't want to go too much into detail, but I try to summarize, summarize in the end my findings in, in the second column. So from a challenge party's perspective, and there's Catherine de Vries, um, her colleagues at LEC, whose name I can't remember right now. In the end, what they show us that challenger parties will try to do more policy for the people at home, which in the end also means that probably there's less political space and less salience for foreign policy making. This also comes back in the other two although a bit with a different twist so in, from the new transnational cleavage literature and here mostly read Marx and Hofer, they really talk about this idea that we see a securitization. And again, for foreign policy making, that can also mean that you try to securitize short term instead of thinking about tackling certain problems in a long term perspective. What I also found quite insightful is the new transnational cleavage literature also talks a lot about this rejection of pooling of sovereignty but also this idea of less European cooperation, but doing more domestically. And again, I think here we see a clear link to European foreign policy cooperation that I will come back later on. Um, because there's, there's of course this idea that, well, if you're trying to do more at home, it doesn't necessarily have to go against European cooperation, but if you do more at home without even considering the European level, then we have, we have an issue for European foreign policy cooperation. The populism literature, and what I find most interesting there is actually the, the, the second and the third point. So this idea of not having any constraints for popular will also means that you're very careful what you make agreements of in Brussels. That you're very careful not to constrain yourself because again, it would constrain the popular will. And what I also find then related to that quite interesting is this rejection of compromising, okay? I only agree to something if I get what I want. But that actually goes very much against the idea of cooperation and this idea of compromising that is so central um, to cooperation. So I really think that there's some interesting things to tell of how populist thinking actually rejects the idea of foreign policy cooperation, in our case, on, on the European level. Um, we try to, to, to think about some of, of these things in this policy brief that, that has just been published by Arena. Um, which is part, which in the end uh, is, is, was the first policy brief of a project that they're doing on the leg legitimacy of EU foreign and security policy in the age of global contestation. We are really delighted to start off with, but you will also see that on the pan on populism, we probably still have more questions than answers. So we know that there is now less, there are less tools and less political cloud uh, for foreign policy actors in many capitals. Um, we also seem to see that European capitals care less about foreign policy making. Um, but I'm always joking with Nick, our next big project will be to actually um, try to come up with a tool of how to measure commitment. How do you measure member states' commitment to European foreign policy cooperation would be a really useful contribution, I think. But again, here we have probably more question marks than answers, simply also because you have 27 of them. And then there's the question, you know, does everyone have to be committed or is it good enough to have the big ones committed? So I think there's also then the, this issue of how do you actually make sense of the collective of 27 member states? The last two points though, I find really interesting. And again, here, I think the comparative politics literature really can help us more in foreign policy making to understand better. Because I think what I really took away from the populist literature is that populism is very much about dividing. It's the us versus them. And again, it goes against this idea of cooperation and compromise, but it also emphasizes this idea that you can go it alone. Okay? Um, I've been living in the UK for a couple of years now. And this idea that, oh, the UK can do it alone and it doesn't need its European partners to solve things, for me is very much an illustration of this dynamic. What I always find fast, quite fascinating is this, this, this logic of, oh, we can go it alone, but actually no one talks of, can you actually achieve the same things on your own without cooperation? But this part of the discussion is very often missing then. Linked to that, 
is an interesting observation that actually two colleagues made in the special issue that we are currently working on, uh, which could show that in quite a few countries nowadays, foreign policy and European foreign policy cooperation becomes solely an instrument for domestic politics. So it is not an instrument to represent your interests, promote your norms, to get what you want, but it is reduced by political leaders to make them look good in the domestic context and in the end towards their voters. And that's really, I think, one of the trends that we are seeing that, that is most crucial that you don't do foreign policy making anymore for its own sake, but you use it in the end for your political advantage. So let me now come um, a bit to the systemic um, perspective and probably again here, I'm on the one hand saying, okay, we see a lot of impact of populism on uh, foreign policy making. This domestic context is changing and it has an effect on European foreign policy cooperation. But in the last year, Nick and I also spent quite some time to think of contestation in the common foreign and security policy. Um, and I think the two, the two main points that we are making here is that on the one hand, we had, of course, a lot of Europeanization literature, but actually this Europeanization literature was very much looking at Brussels actors or at national actors that regularly went to Brussels. Um, and we actually would propose a different way of thinking about Brusselization. So Brusselization not being this process that you have now national actors going to Brussels and discussing there, but Brusselization in terms of being Europeanization of the actors that meet in Brussels. But what we see, is that a lot of this Europeanization dynamics actually haven't arrived in the capitals. Political elites in the capitals are not socialized to the same extent like the diplomats are. Political leaders in the capitals are not socialized to the same extent like the diplomatic actors are. And that creates again a certain tension that we also could observe in our research on the PSC, that the role of the PSC ambassador 10, 15 years ago was much more prestigious and considered much more valuable in terms of the foreign ministry hierarchy than it is nowadays. That the PSA ambassadors nowadays don't have a direct connection to their foreign minister very often. What was quite a bit different in the past, and I'm not saying across all countries, but we could really see that the role of the, this hierarchy has, has been changing. The second point that we are making in this, in this research is really that a lot of talk that is linked to this idea of Europeanization and de-Europeanization through due to populism um, treats renationalization as, 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 a, as an issue of competence. You know, now we're not making foreign policy on the European level, but on the national level. And the point that we are making, it's, it's not a matter of competence, but actually of ambition. And to, to give you a bit more context of this, so this is a, a paper that we are doing for a special issue that hopefully will appear soon in European security. Um, and where we had the, the pleasure um, of our editors, who are Katja Biedenkopf, Ora Kost, and Magdalena Gora, to really think of, OK, what is contestation? What is politicization? And if we take this scholarship that is out there and apply it to European foreign policy cooperation, what does change? And as, as I was already saying, Nick and I were quite critical because for quite some time, many colleagues who looked at contestation looked at decision making. So they looked at decision making and said, oh, members did disagree, so that must be contestation. And what we actually try and do in this paper is that we ask, well, if we take a systemic contestation, so if we take the transgovernmental nature of European foreign policy cooperation seriously, what does that mean for how we think about contestation? And um, that's in the end how we come up with to different ways of looking at contestation. The central part again for us is that we see European foreign policy cooperation. We don't look at the actors, but we look at the system. And we still say, well, the central actors in the system are the member states. But our argument is by just looking at one member state or the other who disagrees, you actually miss the rest of the picture. But the rest of the picture matters because again, we have advanced governmental system of European foreign policy cooperation, where member states are so key in, in getting uh, European foreign policy making going. What that means for us is that we develop two notions of contestation. So on the one hand, we say, well, instead of just talking about contestation as disagreement and decision making, we should think about passive contestation. 
And by passive contestation, we actually really move the bar because we say, well, if you're in a transgovernmental policy system where you have institutions that support you in policy initiation and implementation, but we're at, in all the different cycles of the policy side, in all the different stages of the policy cycle, you will have to be an active member. That means that if you're not active in this transgovernmental policy system, you're contesting too. So we in the end, we are not saying that this is happening all the time, but we suggest that in order to understand contestation, we have to widen the definition. Just being there and not saying anything for us is not support for the CFSP. But member states who disengage or fail to take interest in ownership of initiatives or their implementation in the end, in our argument, are contesting too. And here, probably one quote where I thought Nick Foreman did it so nicely that I really wanted to share it with you, because I think it really captures our thinking about contestation, where we say the passivity on the part of member states also amounts to a form of contestation, simply because without member states' activism, the CFSB simply can't work. Um, and then also brought you two quotes um, that I thought are quite telling. Uh, but in the end, what they show you is that on the one hand, it's about ownership, but also, it's also about implementation. What we try to do with these quotes, and again, they are from a couple of interviews that we had in Brussels, is not necessarily that we, systemic, that we systematically test if our concepts actually work and are applicable to all the member states. But we are suggesting and illustrating that this way of thinking about contestation from policy cooperation actually has an added value. So the first quote in the end um, was by one of the PSC ambassadors who says, well, we are focusing the energy of getting something, but there's little strategic sharing out of responsibilities. What are we doing now to achieve that? We do it more in security and defense, but in classical foreign policy, not really. In this regard, there's no, not sufficient esprit de corps among the ministers. They come to the meeting, so the Foreign Affairs Council, because they have to, but don't necessarily feel a connection between what is achieved in Brussels and what they do. It could be a lot more, this sharing of responsibilities. We would have potentially dramatic increase of leverage. We heard that actually quite a lot that the Foreign Affairs Council nowadays is not an important forum anymore. Uh, foreign, foreign Affairs ministers come, they participate, but you don't have this political spirit again that you had 10, 15 years ago, but it's more that they come, they talk, they go home. The other point that we are making is, well, because it's a uh, transgovernmental policy system, actually our foreign minister should, be, should also think of how they implement and support the implementation of foreign policy decisions. But again, very often we don't see that happening um, uh, after foreign affairs councils. Uh, another quote uh, goes a bit more to this idea of um, taking, taking the lead in, in, in thinking about initiatives. Um, and here, um, our interview said there are a couple of member states now who, when certain issues are at stake, are prepared to pursue their own national objectives quite ruthlessly, like quite deaf to the kind of appeals to compromise or solidarity or keeping the show on the road that normally drive a committee like this. And there are more instances of this kind of behavior now, and it's a source of a lot of anxiety among the other member states, if you like. Oh, sorry, no, I lost. Oh, yeah, if you like, as to whether the kind of basic principles of loyal cooperation we know, basically understanding we have to try and work for consensus, whether they are now a bunch of member states who really just don't care about that. Okay, and again, I just wanted to bring you this as, as an illustration that it's about ownership, but also this implementation that is so key in a transgovernmental system. The last quote also brings me very nicely to a second conceptual uh, contribution that we're making, because on the one hand, it's this passive contestation, so that you actually, by not doing, you can also contest, but we also say you can tacitly contest. And our argument is here is that, of course, we see some member states government who are much more proactively contesting or trying to avoid decisions in foreign policy making or in EU foreign policy making. Um, and we say, well, you know, just being there and pointing the fingers to those that disagree is actually not good enough. But if you really care about the CFSB and European foreign policy cooperation, you should actually try actively to engage these member states and to overcome the disagreement. And that's where we call tacit contestation when apathy is worse than disagreement. Uh, and the way we define it, the member states fail to act when faced with the need to safeguard the system. 
Um, and here we really see that empirically it seems a mixed bag. So you, some of you might have heard that uh, there was a proposal to introduce qualified majority voting in the common fund and security policy. And what was interesting is that member states very much saw it as, as a way um, to overcome uh, the disagreement of some member states. Nevertheless, all of them also said, well, it's actually not a solution. It's a tool that we could introduce, but it's actually not going to help us because it's not a proactive instrument that will help us to get the spirit back and to actually engage everyone that is needed to make European foreign policy making work. Uh, I'll probably hear a quote from that refers to Hungary. At the same time, I want to see one thing, want to say one thing that I always find interesting whenever we talk about populism from policy cooperation, everyone seems to point to Hungary. No one talks about the other member states that very often um, uh, in the end block decisions in foreign policy cooperation. So you see increased quantity of contestation, I would say, from Hungary, also from some other member states, but actually the quality of contestation you, you see across member states. And I think that that's actually the more interesting story to tell. Why does all of this matter? So on the one hand, what we already also heard from, from ambassadors or other interviewees that, well, if you get rid of this sense of collective responsibility or this principle of loyal cooperation, so meaning that you you only block when you have a good reason, but you make sure you justify and you explain to the others why you block so that they can actually help you to overcome your blockage. Um, in the end, what everyone's saying, well, it doesn't seem that there's enough trust between member states anymore to overcome these doubts of ineffective, ineffectiveness and mistrust. So actually there's so much mistrust in the system at the moment that the system itself can't deal with it. And it would need proactive engagement, either through institutional actors or through the other member states to overcome these blockages. The second thing what we keep seeing lately is that because member states don't want to constantly talk about their disagreements, they simply now focus on policy areas where they can agree and don't talk about the rest. For a foreign policy sector that has the ambition like the EU has, as I showed you at the beginning, this is simply not an option. You can't just pick and choose what the things are that you react to and ignore the rest because it's inconvenient and people might see your disagreement. So we also see that this is really an issue that sometimes we see now discussions going on about issues that are not the most salient, the most relevant. And again, we are, we are thinking it's, this is just a decoy and actually doesn't help European foreign policy cooperation. So that was a very quick run <laughs> through the three different arguments, but I hope it gave you a bit of sense of what our thinking is in terms of how this different type, type of European domestic politics. So I think it's also not just that European domestic politics matters, but we see a different type of domestic politics, that it has a long lasting effect on European foreign policy cooperation. On the one hand, again, we see Increased institutionalization, but just because more is happening doesn't necessarily mean that it, that it actually matters. Um, or it's the most important things that are happening. One point maybe still on the institutionalization. One thing that we found also interesting, and I also had that a bit from my European diplomacy research, is that because there are now more institutional actors, there are more, more member states who sometimes take take a back seat and say, oh, I don't have to do it because the European External Action Service is doing it. And we actually see that here, I think there's a certain, a certain tension in the system because the External Action Service doesn't have to put it a cloud of the member states. It can never achieve the same political messaging that the member states can, can achieve. So I think there's also a real danger that by saying, oh, we institutionalized, we created a certain body that's why we member states don't have to take initiative or we don't have to implement is a really is a really worrisome. And again, I think it goes a bit with this domestic context of not caring too much about foreign policy making anymore. On the second point, again, can you cooperate if populists question cooperation at home? And again, I think what's important here that we don't only look at the populists that are most loud, but that we also look at how the rest of the member states react to symptoms of these challenges or how they try to mitigate some of this of these difficulties and that's in the end where the systematic account comes in.
I've been talking for a very long time, so I will not shut up. And um, of course, look very much forward to your questions and comments. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Heidi. I think you gave us a lot of um, thought, food, a lot of things to digest. I think it was a really uh, interesting and very well structured presentation. Um, thank you for that. I will now um, stop the recording. So everybody is free to.